most implementations. So this could then go off. You could have a different plugin implementing this that could then go up and look up the user's details from, say, uh, a human resources system or a central user management system and come back with their, their name and what other details you want. And then the last one, I'll just mention a groups plugin. Uh, again, one method, get groups for principal. And you give it the principal, i.e. the user, normally. And it will return a, uh, a sequence of groups. So again, this is how you can look up, uh, how Plone looks up what groups a user is a member of. So by default within Plone, you have uh, what's called the ZODB group manager. And that stores the group mappings within Zope. So if you just install Plone out of the box, when you go and assign somebody to a group, it stores it within the ZODB. But it could do something else. So for instance, we've used it before uh, looking up group membership via LDAP from an Active Directory server, um, looking at uh, email distribution lists that they use in Outlook. So somebody might use Outlook and define an email distribution list. That also, that email distribution list happens to be a very good um, uh, mapping of, of which users might be in a particular department or a particular group. Um, and so you can use, use that. So plugins are configured within the Zope management interface. Uh, you go into the ACL users folder and click on plugins. And you will have a list of plugins there. And if you click on a particular one, so we're going to say authentication plugins, and you can have more than one plugin. So in this case, we've got two active plugins, one called source users and one called session. So source users is the one that looks up the users within the ZODB. Uh, session is the one that looks at the session cookie that is set when a user is authenticated. And plugins can be stacked, and you can rearrange their order as to which plugin is tried first. So with authentication, it tries each plugin in turn until one of the plugins is able to authenticate the user. That means you can have some users stored locally in the ZODB and some users stored in a relational database. In real world terms, that becomes very useful when, for instance, um, you are doing some uh, implementation work for a large organization, but you are not necessarily in that organization. You might be an outside consultant or an implementation company. You need to be able to log into the system, but they might not be willing to give you an actual account in their centralized system um, where everybody else is. So by doing this, you can have your own account locally within Plone uh, and still look up users in an external system. So if you look at a plugin, so if we look at the source users plugin, uh, there's an activate tab along the top. And this lists the different aspects of authentication. So in this case, this plugin is responsible for authentication, adding a user, enumerating users, not user introspection. That's been disabled. So this plugin implements that, but we're not using it for that. And that's another, another really quite nice feature, is that you can choose or install a plugin, but you don't have to use all of its features for, for authentication. You can mix and match. So it uses, it implements uh, user management, and we've switched that on. So there's a number of example PaaS plugins out there. So the ZODB user manager is the one that comes with Plone that people all use um, without necessarily knowing it within, within Plone. LDAP multi-plugins, if anybody has installed Plone LDAP, if anybody works in any kind of university, they will probably have done this, uh, installed Plone LDAP. And that uses the, the LDAP multi-plugins. There's a new one uh, written by Red Turtle uh, just recently called uh, paz.plugins.velroofs. Velroofs is a project to create a, uh, social, a centralized social sign-on system. So you may be familiar with, uh, there was a service called RPX by a company called Janrain, and it, you could allow, that would allow you to authenticate somebody via Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, Delicious, whatever it was, you know, a whole list of different um, uh, systems for authenticating. But uh, RPX was an external system, and you had to pay to use it, and it was hosted somewhere else, which was, meant it was nice and easy to integrate with because it wasn't your problem, somebody else dealt with it. Uh, but Velrus is something you can host locally. Uh, it's actually a pyramid app uh, that you can just run locally. And so we've used that for a, a system to authenticate people via Google. So we have uh, a Velrus server. It's just a very simple, small uh, py uh, pyramid app. 
running on the, on the same server that Plone is. And that's configured to be able to uh, do OAuth authentication to Google. So when somebody comes to the Plone site using this, this PaaS plugin, it redirects them to the Velrus server, which in turn redirects them onto Google. They log into Google. They come back to the Velrus server, which then redirects them back to Plone. And they're then logged in uh, with their, their Google ID as their, as their login. There's two that uh, we've written at NetSite, uh, netsite.windowsauth plugin. That's the one that does transparent single sign-on in a uh, Windows or just a Kerberos uh, environment. And uh, netsite.aspx auth plugin, which I'm going to talk about in a, in a little bit. So I mentioned about combining PaaS plugins, about how you can uh, use them uh, to do different, th different aspects of the authentication process and mix and match. So we're going to go through a worked example and show that, uh, just give you an example of how you can create your own PaaS plugin. So this is one that I wrote recently called netsite.aspx auth plugin. It encrypts and decrypts a cookie that is set by .NET applications called ASPX auth. And the use case for this was that we had a client who had an existing .NET application, and they were commissioning us to build them a Plone site, and they wanted to have single sign-on between the two, so that when somebody logged into one, when they went to the other one, it automatically knew who they were. And what we did is we thought, okay, well, if we can decrypt and encrypt this uh, cookie that .NET sets, then we can pretend to be a .NET application and uh, then that keeps the .NET side happy. And we don't have to do any changes to the .NET application. We, we couldn't even do the changes contractually. We had no control over it. But it meant that uh, the .NET application would just transparently think that it had already logged somebody in. If they logged into Plone, they'd go to .NET, says, oh, you're logged in already, and, and vice versa. So what I'm going to show you is a slightly simplified version. I'm going to ignore a lot of the boilerplate code uh, within, uh, within PaaS within creating a PaaS plugin. And I'm going to ignore all the crypt cryptography of this plugin. So this plugin has to do a fair bit of cryptography to decode and encode this uh, plugin, uh, this cookie. Uh, and it took quite a bit of time to reverse engineer that um, because Microsoft do not document uh, their stuff. Well, how did that happen? I know, shocking. Um, they did document it. They documented it for two different versions. They had a .NET 2 version and a .NET 4 version of the cookie. And then a security update came out at some point in time that completely changed the cookie format to something else that is not documented. Um, and between searching around some stuff, I managed to find that somebody else had half reverse engineered it, and I managed to uh, finally finish it off uh, so that we can pretend to be a .NET app. Ooh. So my plugin's just going to uh, implement three interfaces, and I need to provide three different methods. We need to extract the credentials, i.e. in this case, we need to extract the cookie from the browser. We need to authenticate the credentials, i.e. we need to decrypt this cookie uh, with a key that we've, we've got configured on the, on the uh, cookie, uh, sorry, on the plugin, um, and validate that it is correct. And we need to be able to reset the credentials, which means we need to be able to delete the cookie from the browser at the end. So when somebody hits log out, it logs them out both Plone and .NET. There's one more that I've missed off here that we implemented, which is um, uh, update credentials. So the cookie has a lifetime. Uh, typically, it's a lifetime of, I think, uh, two hours or something like that. And what happens is it detects when it gets near the end of that lifetime, and it resets and, and creates a new cookie that is valid for another two hours. For simplicity, I've, I've left that off here. But those were the only four methods that we needed to implement in order to do this. So let's walk through them. Um, hopefully you can read this. Uh, all these slides will be up on SlideShare shortly, uh, if you want to have a look at them. So we need to extract the credentials. Uh, we have a security declaration at the top. We declare this as private because nobody else needs to be able to get to this but PaaS itself. Uh, we've got the, 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 the signature there that we extract the credentials. We get given a, a request object. So in this case, uh, we look in the cookies dict in the request object, and we get the ASPX auth cookie. If we've got one, we create a new dict called creds. And uh, I'm going to store in there the cookie itself. I'm also going to store in the ID of my plugin. And you'll see why in a second. Or we return the credentials. That's all we have to do. That's, that's it for that bit. Very simple. 
This next one's a little bit longer. It goes over two slides, but again, not that difficult. Uh, authenticate credentials. Here we get passed in the credentials dict that was extracted in the last uh, process. We just uh, convenience set the request and response to some local variables. Uh, if credentials.grep plugin is not equal to self get ID, then return none. So we're checking to see that the ID uh, of the plugin is the ID of the plugin that extracted the credentials. Now that might seem a bit strange, but the reason being, like I said, is you can mix and max, mix and match different plugins to do different things. And what you don't want to do is have one plugin that extracts uh, a username and password from a, a dialog box for the user, trying to then use that with our ASPX auth cookie uh, plugin and vice versa. So we just make sure that that we did this plugin, we did actually do the extraction. We extracted the credentials. Uh, we get the cookie. If we don't have a cookie, we abort. Um, by returning none, we say we can't authenticate the user. What PAS will then do is it will then go on to the next plugin in the list and, and try that. This is the magic self.decode cookie. All weird, nasty crypto things happen, but basically we take the cookie and we end up with a signature and uh, some data. Uh, again, more crypto magic, wavy hands, crypto magic. Uh, we check the signature and we check that it's valid, right? We then decrypt the data and we get some decrypted stuff. And we unpack the data and we get out of it a, a whole series of bits of information from here. So we get the start time, the end time, the username, the version of the cookie, whether or not it's persistent, some other user data. There's a bunch of stuff that gets set by .NET. We just want the username. And so we just return the username. And in this case, we treat the user ID and the login as the same because that's the only information we have. But we return that. So if we've got to this stage, we've decrypted the cookie, we, we validated the cookie, we decrypted the cookie, we've extracted the information from it, and we just return it. That's it. We now have an authenticated user. That's all you need to do. It's really quite simple. So if you need to... Uh, take some of these details and look it up in a database, then you would just basically replace this with you know, your code to go look stuff up in a database. And then we want to reset the credentials. When somebody hits log out in Plone, this gets called, and all we do is we delete the cookie. We expire the cookie um, from the browser. Done. So hopefully that gives you an idea um, of how PAS works. It's quite simple in terms of what you need to do, what you need to implement in order to uh, make your own PAS plugins. There's a couple of gotchas. User ID versus login. This is something that can get quite confusing. I mentioned it before that Plone does make a distinction between somebody's user ID and somebody's login. And uh, you need to be aware of that because you might end up passing the wrong thing to the wrong method um, when somebody logs in. If, for instance, you're using, so there's a PaaS plugin called Membrane. I didn't mention Membrane. Membrane is one of the main uh, PaaS plugins that people use for using actual content objects within Plone as your authentication source and your, your user information source. Uh, typically, that can be used something along the lines of you create a, say, a, uh, a staff directory or a, a, a user directory within Plone. Each content object represents a particular user, so you might have created an archetype or a dexterity content type called you know, person or something, and you have your full name, last name, whatever, email, yada, yada, yada. And uh, Membrane can look up those objects, does a search for those objects, finds them, and uses them to get the user's details. With Membrane, the user ID is, uh, at least for archetypes, content types, is a UUID. I think it is the same for dexterity as well. But the login will be the username that they type in at the start to log in. So you have to be aware of those two. The other one is plugin performance. So these plugins get called lots of times, especially authenticate credentials. When you make a single request to your Plone site, that authenticate credentials will probably be called 10, 20, 30 times for that request. Uh, so put some caching in there if need be. If you're looking up something from an external data source, Please cache it, use MemoIs or some other caching mechanism. Otherwise, everything will grind to a halt. You, you have to make sure you, you be aware of that. 
plugin uh, plug order, as I mentioned, you can have plugins in different orders, so you need to make sure that you have them in the right order. So um, I mentioned there's an authentication plugin that looks for a session ID in a cookie. Well, you might want that before the one that then goes up and looks up the user in a database, because what you actually want to do is you want to, when they first authenticate, you check and see if they've got a session cookie. No, they don't. The next plugin, go look up the user in the database. You look up the user in the database, and then once they've authenticated, you end up creating the session cookie for them. So the next time the authentication process happens, you want to look for the cookie first, because that's the, 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 the cheapest uh, way to find out the user. That's why you set the session cookie. Uh, you look that up. If that's correct, then you return that the user is authenticated. You don't have to then go to the database. So you can. I said about having to uh, watch out about plugin performance and caching things. Well, you don't necessarily have to cache it if you're using another plugin that might help you. So things like uh, the Plone Session plugin. The really big gotcha at the moment is that uh, I don't know what's going on with Paster and Templar and all of that stuff. Um, hopefully, somebody else does know. Um, is Chris Ewing here? No. Um, there used to be a template in Zope Scale for creating a PaaS plugin. And so you could just say paster create dash T PaaS plugin, and it would produce all the boilerplate code that you need for registering the plugin and instantiating it and adding it and all this lot. And then you just had to fill in those methods, like the three methods I just showed you. You could just literally fill those in and you'd be done. You'd have your PaaS plugin. Uh, it would have a, you go to quick install or you can install it and away you go. For some reason, the PaaS plugin uh, template is not in whatever they're using for the current um, Zope scale stuff. I imagine it's just not been ported. Um, that could be a good sprint topic if anybody is interested in that sort of stuff. So that's it. Obrigado. Um, if you need to get a hold of me, details there. Um, this slide will be on SlideShare, which is that QR code. Um, so yes, the slides will be there. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah. The Windows Auth plugin, did we test it with Kerberos on Linux? Yes. So the actual plugin itself can run on with Plone itself, the server, running on either Linux, in which case it uses the MIT Kerberos libraries, or on Windows, in which case it uses Windows's SSPI um, interface. Uh, the clients can be on uh, Linux, MacOS, or Windows. Uh, Firefox supports Kerberos authentication. Uh, Chrome supports Kerberos authentication. Safari does. IE does now as well. Um, so it is really quite cross-platform. It's quite good, actually. Um, it should be, but the problem being is that nobody, nobody understands that Kerberos is what is used within Windows for the authentication. And the main, the main reason we created that was to authenticate people on Windows. Um, but the great thing being is it does work on all other platforms as, as well. Um, so it's very good. With Windows, the nice thing being is that it automatically uses the credentials that the user logged into their desktop with. So the typical scenario is somebody comes into work in the morning, they switch their computer on, they type in their username and password, their computer authenticates against Active Directory, and they hit the button, the browser comes up, the home page is their intranet, it goes to their intranet, it logs them in transparently. They don't have to do anything. Uh, their browser, their system's gone and got a Kerberos ticket for them and presented that to Plone. It does the same if your Linux desktop's Yes. Yeah, and, and OSX as well. OSX will get Kerberos tickets. It uses Kerberos under the hood as well. So. Right, okay. Right, so the question is about two-factor authentication. Are there any PaaS plugins that do two-factor authentication, such as SMS? Um, I don't know if there is. Um, again, it would not be very difficult to create, because all you would need to do is have your authenticate credentials method um, look up, say, the mobile number of the user. You would have some mapping within Plone, and you would say, okay, uh, this user, their login name, we send an SMS message to this uh, mobile phone number with a random token in it. We store that in some dict or something or in memory for, for five minutes. Um, and uh, then we then try again and we give them a form and they fill that in and, and go in. So yeah, 
The, the PaaS side of things, that should be fairly easy. Um, what I haven't touched on here is the whole kind of dance that Plone does when somebody logs in, which is quite complicated. So when somebody actually hits a Plone site and it says, we don't know who they are, and brings up a login form, they fill in the details, it bounces them around several places, which is evil, but... Right, yes, so the, the thing was with, with two-factor authentication, you need PaaS to, to uh, know that two of the plugins need to uh, return the authentication. Um, I can't remember if PaaS stops when the first one authenticates successfully or whether it tries all of them. I think it might try all of them. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yes, actually, it would stop. Otherwise, there'd be no point in the session plugin. Yeah, so it does, it does stop. So what you would need to do is possibly um, have your, both your plugins being aware of this. What you can do is you could create effectively a uh, sort of a meta plugin that wraps some existing plugins. So that's what the LDAP plugin does, actually. The LDAP plugin actually wraps a, an old LDAP product that wraps another even older LDAP product written by Jens Vagerpol, you know, 600 years ago. Um, and uh, it, it, it works, so reuse the code. Why not? Um, so you could create a meta plugin, and I've done actually the same thing for, for something else to do with uh, the Google logins that I mentioned. When a user came in and we bounced them to Velrus and then off to Google to do their authentication, when it came back it said, okay, this user is you know, matt.hamilton at gmail.com. Well, the intranet originally has no idea who that user is. According to the intranet, my username is, is Matt Hamilton. It doesn't know who this Matt Hamilton at, or hamato at gmail.com is, for instance. So it, what we did is we created like a meta plugin that takes, that calls the original plugin, returns the credentials, then does like a transformation on them, looks them up and says, okay, well, uh, hamato at gmail.com is actually matt.hamilton, and then returns matt.hamilton instead. So then the, the rest of the authentication system all works. So what you could do is create almost like a meta plugin that, uh, that calls both your first and your second factor authentication system and make sure that both of them return true before continuing. Yeah, Guido. Can you uh, share a little detail on the actual crypto involved and on that you developed this other new graph thing? You know, how, how did you find that out and what was involved in this thing? You know, what? Sorry, which one? The crypto aspect. Oh, the crypto aspect. How did I discover the crypto aspect? Um, lots of banging my head on the desk, <laughs> lots of coffee. Um, <laughs> The people that were in the office for me will probably remember that week because I did absolutely nothing but stare at a screen for about a week. Um, uh, looking around online to find out what was there and looking at some of the, uh, some of the authentication code, uh, some of the C-sharp code for the Windows like foundation libraries uh, is, is released open source, supposedly. Uh, open source as in you've got to download Visual Studio in order to unpack the damn library like archive file that they give it to you in. It's not a zip file. Um, you can't browse it online. Um, but if you get the source, you can look through and it does tell you a certain amount of information, which was wrong. Um, and then I managed to find somebody else had got a little bit further reverse engineering it. But other than that, it was just a case of looking at the bytes that came out and try to identify what was what. You know, you could, you could uh, work out that certain lengths of bits of bytes, well, that must be a, uh, you know, a SHA-1 digest or an HMAC or something, and yeah, it was painful. But. Any other questions? Yeah. So if you authenticate through this, how, uh, can, is there a way to get the roles? Yes, there is. So there's a roles, one of the plugins, if I can get my presentation to play again. So there's several plugins to do with roles. Um, role enumeration, roles plugin. Uh, there's a local roles plugin as well there. And so they all have methods for looking up users' roles. And again, because you can mix and match, it, it's great. So you can say, okay, I'm gonna look these user up, users up in whatever LDAP or Active Directory or something like that. Um, but I need to assign them a manager role uh, for the, within the context of Plone. Well, that doesn't mean anything to the rest of the, the university or corporate or whatever, you know, world, um, it just makes sense within Plone. So you could store the roles locally, 
but look up the users there. But yeah, there's, there's a plug in there and whatever, get roles for user, I think. You pass a user ID and go up and look up roles and return them. Yeah. Where were the user IDs stored in the .NET example? Um, which one? The the. Oh yeah, we um, we don't store them anywhere. That's that, that's actually the beauty of it. We do not we don't store any of the user details. All that happens is um, we decode the cookie, and the cookie says this user is Matt Hamilton. So we go, okay, they're Matt Hamilton. We don't actually have a user called Matt Hamilton stored anywhere on the system. It's it's just uh, it, it it just exists for as long as that cookie exists. But you could use another plugin that could say store my full name and email address locally, and as long as that user had the same user ID as what the other plugin discovered, i.e. Matt Hamilton, then it could say, okay, this is their user ID, um, rather this is their full name and their email address. So yes, you can store stuff locally with other plugins, but in this case, the ASPX auth plugin doesn't have to deal with storing anything about users. We, you could, we can use another plugin to do that, or reuse another plugin, rather. Any other questions? Okay. Well, thank you very much. My name is Matt Hamilton, and this talk is how to get started with the Pluggable Authentication System. Hello. For those that come later, the new password is Dornelis. Wi-Fi password is Dornelis with the uh, uppercase D, okay? A nova senha do Wi-Fi é Dornelis com D maiúsculo, para quem chegou atrasado. Eu usei já. A gente trocou agora há pouco. Sometimes it works. <laughs> 